Good morning, True Hope Collister family. Um, I hope that we got this up and running and you guys are able to be online with us. Sorry for the delay. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to our amazing team. I know Laura has volunteered to get this all set up for us, and she's given a lot of time within the last two days to make this possible. Uh, AJ, Lauren, Ryan, uh, Christiana, and Tori, and all the posting and communication and things, uh, we just want to say thank you to them because uh, this is an amazing opportunity. One thing that I want to point out, and uh, Tori is a part of a lot of communication groups with churches that are doing similar things uh, this morning uh, because of the coronavirus, and one of the people in the group said, isn't it amazing to know that tomorrow morning when the world wakes up and they go on Facebook and they look through their feeds and they see all of the gospel presentation, all of the hope of Jesus Christ that's going to be over Facebook because of all of, of the online services that are happening today. It's a really amazing thought to think that God can even use a cancellation of a physical service uh, to help us out in this way. So uh, just be praying for our community uh, be praying for our neighbors, uh, be praying for our world as we go through uh, this crisis together and all of that. Before we get started in our passage, and we're going to be in Psalm 27, but before we go there, there's a few announcements that um, I, I want to make sure that, that we go through today. So first, we want to engage all forms of worship. Now, we're not able to have live worship this morning, but we're working towards that end if we have to do this again. And, uh, and so, but for this morning, go to our website. Um, and I think Tori's put some links out and different things like that. And you can check out our Spotify account, True Hope Collister on Spotify. And you guys can get together and you can listen to um, some, some music together and you can worship and, and just be a group together. So we also want to encourage all groups to, to come together and worship. Um, so if we do this again, maybe consider as a small group getting together on a Sunday morning and, and worshiping together and listening to the worship and, and listening to the message together in that way. Uh, the other thing that I want to share is that while we're canceled today, we're not sure yet what we're going to do next week. This is going to be a week-to-week re week reality to really consider what, what the needs of the community are and what we need to do as a community to meet those needs and to gather and meet the needs of our community. Um, so just stay in the loop with us via email, Facebook, Instagram, um, even some phone calling um, for those that don't participate in those things. We'll make sure to do our best to get the word out to you of what we're doing. But all other activities, our youth groups, our small group meetings, everything else is happening as normal. The staff will still be at work on um, Monday through Thursday, normal office hours. We're here. If you want to come down and use the sanctuary to pray in, we want to open that up for you. And, uh, and in that regard, we are also going to take the opportunity this week to really investigate what the needs in the community are, figure out a way to be intentional in meeting those needs, and wrapping you guys in to help us meet those needs. So um, we're excited about that opportunity. If you're interested and you, you're wondering how you can continue to give, our online giving is up and running, and I just want you to know that as you donate to that, those funds will go to help out the ministry needs in our community um, and, and the normal ministry expenses that we have because we're not shutting any of that down. So um, just grateful for you and your partnership as we move into this. So uh, the last thing that I want to kind of point out is today is our two-year anniversary. So we want to celebrate what God has done in the relaunching of Collister, True Hope Collister, and how he's brought together two different people groups to reach uh, this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in order to do that, we thought, what a cool way to be a community than to wear similar clothes and apparel together. So like this hat, we have an online apparel store. I believe the link is uh, connected to Facebook. It's been in the emails. It's on our website. And you can go and pick out your favorite merch and, uh, and purchase that. When you do so, we will go and pick it up in a few weeks, and we will deliver it to you. And uh, it's just a way to connect together and identify together as the body of Christ here at True Hope Collister. So we're excited to, to give you that opportunity as well. And then parents, uh, Christiana and Melinda have worked really hard to give you a resource to worship at home and to have a lesson at home with your kids. So um, you can go online, you can go to our True Hope Collister parent page on Facebook. Uh, I believe Christiana has emailed it out to those we have email addresses for. 
um, as a way to just kind of have a really cool experience uh, with your family at home. So please check that out. And uh, we'll have more information and all of the things that we're going to be doing uh, in, the, in this next week, in the coming days. So the past week especially, but this past month to several weeks, has been a roller coaster of emotion. Um, I know for my family specifically this week, with all of the talk of the spread and, and the coronavirus finally coming to Idaho and the conversations that we've had with our children, there's been an array of emotion. There's been emotion of concern and heartache for those that are experiencing the tragedy of this virus and the danger of this virus. Um, and as they've lost loved ones that they, they, they love dearly. We also are experiencing confusion. What is happening? Why is this happening? Where is God in it? It's confusing to go to the grocery store and see empty shelves. It's confusing to know why. There's no toilet paper in the valley. And, and, and it's weird and a weird situation to kind of engage. We're experiencing um, disbelief and, and why. And, and why are people responding with fear the way that they are? And at times, we've even discussed fear and experienced the idea of fear and what all of this might mean and what all the ripple effects might be. And that's really what I want to speak to today. How do we engage these emotions, these feelings that we are having in a way that honors God and is helpful um, to our family, to our friends, and, and propels the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world at large. So we just want to take a moment and go to Psalm 27 this morning. So if you'll take your Bibles and go to Psalm 27. As you're turning there, I want to reiterate why we have chosen to not hold physical services. Um, it's not a decision based out of fear for us. It's a decision that we prayed actually quite a bit about. It's a decision where we held um, emergency meetings to discuss how we move forward with this. And ultimately, I think Romans 15, 1, where the Apostle Paul is talking to the Roman church, and he says this, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. My heart actually aches that we can't be together in our normal way today. Um, my heart aches that we can't go to the two services like we've planned and celebrate and honor God with what he has done. But family, this is an opportunity for us to serve our community. And by us saying no to gathering together, what we are saying yes to is creating space in order for our community to get a handle on the coronavirus, to slow the infection rate, and to love our, our medical staff and community so they don't become too overwhelmed, and a way to love the elderly in our community and the medically vulnerable, those that have respiratory issues, that the coronavirus would be extremely dangerous if they contracted it. And so really, this is an act of love. This is an act of, of justice, if you will, where we are saying we're gonna sacrifice our wants and our desires to honor and respect our leaders who are recommending we don't meet in government and to honor and respect those within our community that, that we are seeking to share the hope of Jesus with. So as we engage, if, if you will, this opportunity, will you pray with me for our government leaders? Will you pray with me for our neighbors and friends? And will you pray for our medical personnel as they seek to do the best they can to help us overcome this medical crisis that we're facing? Psalm 27, I think, is going to give us some great insight on how we can engage this idea of fear. As I was thinking about fear last night, I was thinking about this idea that there's, there's not a lot of inspiration in our world in times like this to not panic, to not, to, to not overreact and step out. And I came across this interview um, with uh, Stephen Colbert and Amanda Pete, and I found it quite um, appropriate for our conversation today. So uh, we're going to play this video, and then um, we'll talk about it here in just a second. All right. As you watch that video, I know it's a unique conversation. Um, the crisis that she has is that she fears death. And they begin to talk about heaven and all of this. And her last statement is the one that caught me. And she looked at Stephen Colbert and said, I'm sorry, that just is not that inspirational. It's not that helpful. 
And family, as the body of Christ, we have an inspirational hope. We have a hope that can propel us with great confidence through times of tragedy, through times of crisis, through times of the unknown, through times when all control is out of our realm and we're just wondering what and how to proceed. It is the hope of Jesus Christ that propels us through all of that. And I want to take a look into the life of David in Psalm 27 and kind of walk through some lessons on how to engage the unknown, how to engage the fear that, that we are facing through his example. So let's go to Psalm 27. We're going to start in verse 1. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to read through the whole passage, 14 verses, and then just give you three insights uh, that I see of things that we can do to engage our fear or the fear of the unknown. So Psalm 27, verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. I love this next phrase. Whom shall I fear? If he's my light, there's nobody to fear. That's the confidence and the hope that we have is he is above everything and in control of absolutely everything. It goes on to say, the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and flows, foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arises against me, yet I will be confident. I'd love for you to underline and circle that word confident. We have this ability to be confident in what is unknown to us because it's known to God. In verse 4 it says, One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, here's an amazing statement, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire, to ask questions in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He'll stand in front of me in essence. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Verse 7 is an amazing way to start this off. It says, hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. God is interested in what you're feeling. He's interested in the rawness of what you're feeling. It's not wrong that we wonder or that we even fear. What, where the issue comes in is what we do with that fear. And when we turn to the Lord and give it to him, we find solution and we find confidence to move forward. So hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. And my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. That confidence again. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. Very dangerous situation for David. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait, that word in the Hebrew can also be tra translated hope. So wait or hope for the Lord. Be strong and let out your heart. Take courage, wait or hope for the Lord. One of the things that's interesting to me about this passage is the context in which it was written. It is uh, believed that David, while anointed by Samuel, has yet to take the throne uh, that he was promised. It is believed that, that he is being chased and hunted by Saul. He is in exile away from his wife and family. He's in exile away from his best friend, one he called his soulmate, Jonathan. And, and he is on the run for his life. And it is in that situation 
that David prays these words to God Almighty. So what can we learn? What is there for us to know and understand about how we battle the fear that we face? I want you to go back to verse two and look at that. Number one, we praise God for what he has already done. In the Christian standard uh, version of the Bible, it says this, when evildoers came against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. There's this idea in the life of David that he never forgot. Even when David was facing Goliath, you remember the entire uh, Israeli army was out in fear and cowering against the Philistine army. The Philistines sent on a champion in Goliath, and David saw that nobody was willing to step up. And so David goes and says, Saul, I'll go out there. I'll fight him. And what does he do? He remembers how God provided for him in the past. He remembered fighting the bear. He remembered fighting the lion. And he remembered how God gave him power. And he remembered the provision of God. And so he went out in confidence, in trust, that God would once again provide for him. So what do we do when we face fear? Number one, praise God for what he's already done in your life. Remember how he has blessed each and every one of us. The fact is, is we have amazing families at home. We have an amazing church family. We have opportunities to encourage each other and equip each other through the hard times. We have opportunities to serve each other and we have people that are longing to serve us when we're going through the heartache. God has given us so, so much. Some of you know a little bit more of my story, but there was a time, and I've mentioned this before, that, that Andrew and I were really contemplating being done with ministry. We had gone through this extremely difficult time. It was very lonely. It was a, a verbally abusive situation. We were threatened. Um, uh, we were pregnant with Brennan and our insurance and our, our livelihood was threatened and we were like, what are we going to do? But the thing is, is as I look back on those moments, God didn't just provide. He gave us a community that restored our hearts, met our physical needs and loved us into full restoration and healing and vigor for the calling that God had placed upon each of our lives, Andrea and mine and our families. God is a God who has provided, and because of that past provision, we can trust that he will provide. So one way to engage fear is to remember and praise him for what he has already done in our lives. The second thing and how we engage fear that David laid out for us in verses four through six, if you wanna look at those with me, is we worship God for who he is. We worship God for who he is. There is a quote by Craig Rochelle on Instagram this morning that says this, our faith is not based on what God does. Our faith is based on who God is. I want you to look at verses four through six. It says, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. David, when facing fear and overcoming circumstances, wanted to be in the presence of God. And in that presence, he was reminded of who God is. He is the sovereign. He is in control. And I get it. Um, if you are in your 50s or 60s or 70s and the stock market takes a hit like it did this past week, you're wondering if you're gonna have enough provision that you would hope for to get through the coming days. Well, God is a God who provides. Our money doesn't provide for us. God provides for us. And David knew that, and he wanted to be in the presence of God for one reason, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He wanted to be in the presence of God, to see him, to be reminded of his greatness. This is where worship is important. And we worship in many ways. We worship through studying the word of God. So reading your Bible when you are feeling fear will, will bring back to memory the things that God has done and it will also reveal who he is. Singing a song of worship and praise with the radio or with our Spotify list or with your own playlist of, of music that you love and like. And just taking that time to lift his name up will give us a weapon to fight against the fear 
that the enemy wants us to stay trapped in. And we do, we have an enemy. And he longs to keep us trapped in the bondage of fear. And God has provided in who he is a way to the freedom and, and to experience joy in his presence. So the second thing that we do is we worship God for who he is. Finally, in verses seven and eight, if you go and look at those, we talk to God about what we are feeling. Your feelings are not bad. You were designed to feel. The emotions and the things that we are experienced are connected to our creation and connected to the image of God. I would even go as far to say our ability to feel painful emotions is a gift that God gives us because it reminds us that we can't, but he can. It reminds us to look in, into the past and how he has provided, and it reminds us to look into who he actually is. And so when you're feeling fear or worry or anxiousness or concern, use those as a check engine light to remind you to pray to remind you to go to the Lord. Look at verse seven. It says, hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. The picture here is an uncontained emotion that cannot be stuffed anymore. It is an overwhelming circumstance, and David is crying out with all that is within him. It is raw, it is unfiltered, and it is before God, and God receives it. God listens to it. We saw in previous verses that God is inviting us to come in and to inquire of him. We see in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 that he invites us to pray to him to, not, to, to lead us away from temptation because it's in our emotions when they are unchecked and they are not processed with the Father. It is in those unchecked emotions that the enemy has opportunity to lead us astray in temptation. And so Jesus is inviting us, the Father is inviting us, the Holy Spirit is leading us to process what we are feeling with him. So when we feel fear or anxiousness, stop, pray. He already knows and understands and he longs to feel and hear where you are at and pray with him. And God will hear and he will answer. It says, hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. We don't have to pretend with God. Why? Because he is our loving father. Verse five talks about this idea of him stepping before us, covering us, lifting us above the chaos of the pain that we are feeling. When we stop and we praise him for his past provision and we worship him for who he is and we are honest with him about what we are anxious and afraid about, he will, through the presence of his Holy Spirit, lift us above the circumstances we are in and give us a clear path to freedom and joy. And here's the beauty of it all, it's something we can experience together. So family, in the coming weeks as the unknown unfolds, know that God is waiting. His plan is unchanged. His will is not in check. It is flourishing. He is in control. He is in charge. And he is inviting us to trust him. But trust is an interesting thing. It's a lot like this jar. If these tr marbles are trust marbles, the more we give God a chance and we say, I'm going to trust you in this circumstance, he will prove himself. And the more this jar gets full with the opportunities where we said, I will trust you with this. I will go to you with this. I will pray with you and cry aloud. I will trust you with my emotions and my heart and the true concerns that I am facing. And we see him answer through his presence, through who he is. It bolsters our trust. So the next time that it happens, it's easier to pick up that marble and put it in. And God is calling us to live a life where our life is full of trust with him. And today he is providing us with an opportunity to actively believe that what he says is true. It may be hard for us to pick up that marble, but I encourage you out of trust, not out of feeling, to go ahead and put it in and watch God answer your prayers. Watch him show up. Watch him be an example uh, and reveal the example of what it means to live confident in this world. So what do we do with this? 
If this is God's word, here's the question that I want you to really process and ask yourself. If Psalm 27 really is the message of God to us today, and it really is his word, and it really is truth, what is God asking me to change this week? Will you spend some time and just process that with him? Will you spend some time and read through Psalm 27 over and over again and say, God, what in this passage is leading me to change in my life? And ask him to reveal it to you. The second thing is prayer. Um, We have been reading through the Seek God for the City books together. And I find it very appropriate that today, Sunday, March 15th, we are seeking God to bring forth justice in our city. And I want to read the passage and And this is the prayer that I'm asking us to pray this week. It says in Isaiah, Behold my servant whom I uphold. God's going to uphold us. My chosen one in whom my soul delights. Did you know God delights in you? You bring him joy. I have put my spirit upon him. He's equipped us. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. God will not be thwarted or discouraged by the things of this world. He will overcome. So the prayer is this, Lord, you send your servant to the cities of the earth. We may have ignored him, but he has long been at work. God is at work, and he will never stop. He has outlasted every compromised king and every corrupt judge. He is heaven's chosen one, mantled with the spirit of God. He has been charged to bring forth justice, and he will not fail. We may have overlooked him because he does not campaign among the rich, nor does he foment revolution among the poor. Instead, he is a healing leader. Jesus, a healing leader transforming the weak to become like him. We we pray for his mission to be accomplished in our city. Let us be found with him, serving among the forgotten and broken. Put his spirit upon us as well so that we can labor with him. And I love this, faithfully in hope. Family, we have an opportunity to be an example of what true hope looks like in this world. And when we feel panic and we feel worry and we feel anxiousness, how we respond to those feelings will empower us to either be like those who panic consistently or to be empowered with the hope of Jesus Christ, to be an example of what true hope is and a pathway for them to experience it. So our prayer is this, for God to bring forth justice and healing for those in our city and for Christians to pray and labor with persistent faith. Will you join me in praying that God will bring forth healing and justice in our city? Will you join me in praying that God will empower us as Christians to pray and labor with persistent faith in this world? So we don't have to fear. We, like David, can live confident in this world. I'm excited for what this opportunity is going to bring. I'm grateful that we are in this together And I'm excited for the day we get to be physically together in presence of worship again. So stay tuned, keep posted, subscribe to our email list, subscribe to Facebook, Instagram, look to our website. We're gonna find every way we can communicate to you in the coming weeks of how we are gonna serve and worship together. Thank you guys so much and I hope you have a blessed Sunday.